Next, let's talk about how we measure pressure. I'm going to start by talking about manometers, and this is a general term for any meter that uses the height of static liquids to measure pressure. To be honest, these are not very practical measuring devices, and they're not used, they're not really used anymore, except for some specific applications. Um, but understanding them is pretty important, understanding how fluids behave, and they're, they're good analogies for lots of systems. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on them, and it's important that you understand how to solve manometer type problems. The first type of manometer I'm going to talk about is a barometer, and this measures atmospheric pressure. And these can be simply made with a pan of liquid and a test tube filled with liquid. And if you flip that over and insert it into the pan and do it carefully so that you don't get any air in there, if you have a tall enough um, test tube, what's going to happen is the weight of that liquid will pull down and leave a, an open cavity at the top of the, the test tube. This will initially be a vacuum, but if you remember back from chapter one, it's not going to stay a vacuum for long. Um, fluids the, at the water, air, or the liquid gas interface, um, molecules of the fluid will fly out into the atmosphere and become part of the gas phase. And we call this vapor pressure. So there will be a small vapor pressure pushing down there, but that is known for liquids. Now to analyze this, I'm going to pick two points in the fluid and I'm going to use what we learned about with pressure that if we have um, two different spots at the same elevation in the same liquid, pressures are going to be the same at those two locations. So we're going to make use of that and we're going to solve for the pressure at A first and that's just gamma H plus that vapor pressure that's pushing down on the column. Note that I'm doing this in absolute pressure, not gauge pressure. And then um, the pressure at B is simply equal to atmospheric pressure. We can combine those because pressure at A equals pressure at B. And this gives us an easy way to measure atmospheric pressure. It's just gamma H plus that vapor pressure. Okay, piezometers are uh, devices that measure pressure at a point. So if we have this chamber filled with some liquid, we can measure the pressure at A simply by attaching a tube to it and lifting it up, and then measuring the height to which water rises in that tube. And we know from what we learned previously that the pressure at A now has got to be equal to gamma H. Um, these are more usefully set up in a U-tube configuration. Notice that this uses two different liquids, so you've got the liquid that you're measuring the, f the pressure of, and then you've got a second fluid, which is shown here in orange. It could have a different density, and um, it's used to measure the pressure. Okay, so if we're trying to measure the pressure at A, um, to solve this, I need to use one point again um, and that is that the pressure in the same fluid at the same elevation has got to be equal. So I'm going to pick these points, B and C, and we know that the pressure of those two points are equal because they're both in the orange fluid. Now there's a little trick here that I need to talk about. The pressure at B, that's in the orange fluid, but it's also in the blue fluid. So it's right at that interface, so I can consider it part of both fluids at the same time. Okay, to solve this, I'm going to start at A, and I'm going to work my way around the, pos the piezometer until I get to another point where I know the pressure. So when I work across horizontally, there's no change in pressure, so I don't have to do anything. Now as I go down, um, this going down leads to a negative influence of pressure on the pressure at A. So it's minus gamma 1 H1. Now that I'm at B, I can jump across to C, because I'm, now I'm in the orange fluid, and it's the same elevation, so they're the same pressure. Then I can work my way back up again until I get back to the air. And since this is going upwards, this has a positive impact on pressure on the tube. And that gives us the pressure at A. Notice that we use the gamma for both liquids, 
and we need to use the two different H's to figure out what the pressure at A is. And you also have to keep track of the sign, whether you're going down or up. It determines whether it's a negative contribution or a positive contribution. Okay, so these are more useful than straight up piezometers. There's two advantages to these. Note, notice with a regular piezometer, if you had a negative pressure, the water would just get, or the liquid just would just get sucked down the tube and you wouldn't be able to read every, anything. It would just be empty. But with a U tube, you can, you can get negative readings because the water level and measuring fluid can be below point A. And then the second thing, second advantage to this is you can choose your measuring fluid carefully. So if you want to measure really high pressures, you can use a really heavy fluid like mercury. Um, if you want to measure um, slight changes in pressure, you can use a really thin fluid. Let's do an example. So we've got this crazy measuring device. And you want to find the pressure at P minus the pressure at A. I'm sorry, the pressure at B minus the pressure at A. We've got three different liquids um, with three different specific weights. And in that, there's a pocket of air in that, the top of that chamber there. Okay, so I'm going to start at A and just kind of work my way across. And you might want to pause it now and try to do it yourself and then see if your answer matches my answer. Um, so I'm going to start at A, I'm going to work across, and there's no change pressure because we're at the same elevation, we're in the same fluid. Now we go down, so that has a negative contribution to pressure. And I want to stop at that interface, um, and then I'm, now we're entering another fluid, so I need to use a different gamma. We're still going down, so it's a negative contribution to pressure. And I want to go until I can jump across to the other side of the tube and still be in the orange fluid. And then I can work my way back up again and that gives us a positive contribution. Now in the air, if you remember, for gases over small distances, there's really no change in pressure with elevation. So I can be anywhere in that air and it's still got the same pressure. So as a result, I can jump across and uh, pressure does not change. Work my way back down again. I don't have to worry about the funny angles. All I'm worried about is the vertical changes. So that's a negative contribution. And now I can work across. And I'm back at, and now I'm at B. So I have the pressure at B. I can combine those and insert the gammas and solve. And I get 412 pounds per square foot. So. That's about as hard as it gets with these. Um, make sure you understand the procedure. We'll do that in this chapter. And this is one of those things that's going to appear over and over again. So make sure you learn it because we will use this in other parts of the course. One other twist you can do to this um, is you can incline the tube where you're measuring the fluid. And you can analyze this the same way. You just kind of work your way around. I'm going to go up vertically instead of at an angle because I'm going vertically and not in the direction of L2, I need to use sine theta in the equation. And the advantage to this is since that last tube is at an angle, you get a more sensitive reading on your pressure than the vertical tube. Okay, so manometers are interesting, but they're actually not very practical for actual measuring devices. Two types of devices are used um, commonly uh, mechanical pressure gauges and these rely almost entirely on Borden tubes and these gauges are used are used for all kinds of things these are your standard inexpensive reliable pressure gauge they're used on scuba tanks they're used on in air compressors um, these are used quite a bit and the the working device here is a Borden tube and it's that arc of metal you see with the, that the red arrow is pointing at. And the way this works is the fluid enters the threaded piece at the bottom of the device. So it enters through that tube right there and goes into the device and then enters that Borden tube. That arc of metal is actually a tube that's curved. 
So it's a tube that's been bent. And as pressure increases on that tube, that tube is flexible, it wants to straighten out. As pressure decreases, that tube wants to curve more. So this is like one of those um, party paper rolls that you can blow into and they sometimes they honk and stuff. But that when you blow in it, that tube uncurls. And as you apply more pressure to it, it, it wants to straighten out. And as you decrease the pressure, it wants to curl back up again. So that's how this works. So as that deflection, as that tube is deflected by changes in pressure, the tip of it is connected to a bunch of levers and gears, which connects to a, a, a pointer so you can measure pressure. You could also connect the Borden tube to some sort of electrical sensor and have a, a digital display on it. Um, an aneroid barometer works in a similar way. It's got a hollow chamber that um, is connected to a lever. And as atmospheric pressure increases, that chamber um, compresses. As atmospheric pressure decreases, that chamber expands. So that flexible metal uh, either expands or contracts. And then there's a lever and gears attached to it to connect to a pointer to display that, that lateral movement. Um, and again, that can also be connected to a digital device. But it's important to keep in mind what the actual measuring device is, not whether you have a pointer or a digital readout. Um, the Borden tube and the vacuum chambers, these are both very reliable, very useful pressure measuring devices, but they do have their limitations. Um, they are the cheapest, but they are also fairly slow, and they op only operate over a, um, a limited range. Um, if you need quicker response, if you need something smaller, you want to move to an electrical pressure gauge. And these are quite common now, and they're, they've come down quite a bit in price. Um, the most common out there right now is a strain, strain gauge. Um, and if you look at the device on the left, you can see at the bottom of the threaded tube there, there's a tube, and that's where the measurement point is. The fluid, the pressure, the, the fluid pressure that you're measuring the fluid actually enters that tube there, and it's stopped by a flexible membrane. And that membrane deflects, you know, it either expands or contracts based on the pressure that it sees. And the flexible membrane it has uh, strain gauges attached to it. And the way a strain gauge works is as the strain gauge gets deflected, um, it's... It, um, changes an electrical signal that passes through it and that change can be registered and converted to a to a displacement and that displacement in turn can be related to a pressure. So there's a lot of electronics involved in converting the signal from the strain gauge to an actual pressure but electronics are small and they're becoming less and less expensive. So these are, these are great devices. They're a little bit more expensive but they're much more rapid than a Borden tube because you don't have to wait for that um, for this fairly large metal tube to deflect. Um, you have a much smaller device, much more rapid, it measures more rapid changes in pressure, and it can also be calibrated to a, a larger pressure range. A, a vast improvement over even the strain gauges are piezoelectric gauges and these use the same principles as the strain gauge. You have a tube connected to a membrane, in this case it's called a lens, and that membrane is attached to a piezometric element which as it um, deflects or, it, or as it is, experiences strain um, it uh, sends an electrical signal. And these are again a little bit more expensive but they act over an even wider pressure range and they have a much faster response time even than the strain gauge.